tonight. Um, the focus of tonight's workshop is about finding a healthy balance um, with technology during a time when we're all on our devices a lot more. So we are so glad to have Dr. Altiero here with us tonight to provide some insights about the impact of screen time and strategies for setting healthy boundaries around screen time for our kids. Dr. Altiero has worked in the elementary, middle, and high school levels and has her master's and PhD in counseling education. She's um, an associate program director at the City University of Seattle, and we're really just lucky to have her here with us tonight. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Altiero, to share a little bit more about yourself. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and hello to everybody that is virtually at home. Um, yeah, we're gonna talk about screen use and our kids and how it affects them and how we can manage all of that during this time. Um, let's see how I can, oh, there we go. Um, and I already got a little bit of an education or um, an introduction, so I won't go over uh, all of this, but um, I also run a company called Tiered Educational Consulting. So I do some presentations on this type of uh, topic and other topics for districts. So I like talking to people about technology and other things, um, but I'm also a parent. So I know that you guys are out there, are parents and parenting in this pandemic, and I feel that. Um, I always think it's really important to let people know that you're in that with them. Um, so I have two kids, two boys, a 10-year-old and a four-year-old. Um, my oldest son has ADHD and generalized anxiety disorder. So we have different struggles um, every day with technology and managing it and online school and in-person school. And I know that many of you can relate to that as well. Um, another completely random fact on here is that I do tend to think cats make presentations more fun. So this is a heavy topic. Most of the topics I present on are fairly heavy. So I find that it kind of livens things up and helps to lighten the mood. So if you're like, what are these cat pictures? That's what it's about. Let's see. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna talk about some screen time statistics, um, gaming, smartphones, social media, screen time research, um, the impact of screen time on kids and teens, both positive and negative, not just the negatives, and screen time management. So those are our focal points today. And Kat, right up to start us off, you can see how that helps. Um, so I want to begin with some general statistics. Um, so according to the American Psychological Association, so abbreviated for APA, 90% of kids in the U.S. play some type of video game regularly, with that number increasing to 97% for adolescents, so once you get over the age of 12. Um, before the pandemic, the APA had reported that children ages eight and younger that played video games spent roughly uh, an hour playing handheld console games and about an hour on computer games, 45 minutes on tablet games. So um, depending on what devices are in different houses, it's roughly an hour a day before the pandemic. So we know that that number is likely increased now that we're home because there's, or we've been home because there's less to do and technology has become more kind of the forefront of um, what we have available and what education is being presented to us on. Um, so various resources have reported that from March of 2020 to January of this year, the usage numbers have increased 50 to 70% roughly. Um, as many once in person activities are now online. So there's a there's a lot of information out there, but there's a lot of information that's difficult to obtain because everything is still so new and we're still in the middle of the, um, you know, the fallout of what a lot of us never saw coming and anticipated, which was having to manage online learning and then sometimes going back and then, um, you know, just an entirely new form of being and receiving the education for our kids. Oh, sometimes it lets me hit the space bar and sometimes not. Okay, so uh, what this looks like in terms of the different platforms that kids are using, um, surveys in 2020 um, uh, for teens showed that the highest rated use uh, for social media was Instagram at 84%, using that at least once a month. Second place was Snapchat. Um, TikTok is at 69%, but 
considering that TikTok only came out in the end of 2019, that's pretty significant. Um, Twitter is at 39%, Pinterest 32%, Facebook 28%, and LinkedIn is at 3%. Um, if you were to look at the statistic for adults, it would be almost entirely flipped upside down. So the most significantly used platforms for adults are LinkedIn, Facebook, and Pinterest, and then Twitter. So um, interesting how we're the antithesis of what our teens are doing. So before the pandemic, 95% of teens had access to a smartphone um, reported in 2018, and 45% said that they were on that almost constantly. So the reason that's important to know is that when they're on that phone consistently, 45% um, saying almost constantly, is that this is what they're on there doing often. Um, so Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, things like that. They're using social media most often. Um, some other interesting statistics are the number of minutes spent with social and video apps. So Marketing Charts does a great job of giving us information in real time. Um, so you can see that from May of 2019 to February 2019 to COVID hitting, or February 2020, excuse me, to COVID in um, from March to April 2020, that the percent and the number of minutes that kids were spending with social video apps increased quite a bit. So we went, you know, YouTube went from 57 to 97 um, minutes a day. TikTok was 38. Again, TikTok really dominated last year to 95 minutes a day. Snapchat, 35 minutes a day to 65. Instagram, 40 to 60. So things increased exponentially very quickly. And this only goes through the first part of um, 2020 there. So the numbers are increasing or have maintained at a pretty steady rate since then. So we know that technology is being used uh, consistently. Um, other information that we know, but is always good to see, is that um, platforms outside of just social media and games that have increased are Zoom, Google Classroom, Google Hangouts, um, Microsoft Teams has also seen over three times their users, um, school age kids being among those that are on there the most because we're using these platforms across the country for online learning. Um, so these are huge increases. So from January 15th in 2020 till you know mid-March where it went from uh, you know just over or just under 2 million users on Zoom to um, just under 7 million. So those are huge, huge increases of people having to learn new technology and having it integrated into their daily lives. So not to be discounted. Um, so when we think about all of this, it's important to think about like, what are the you know experts out there recommending when we think about screen time? So. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has some guidelines that they've placed on technology and screen usage by age, but a lot of that has even changed in the last five years with they've really reduced having kind of a, um, a hard set boundary on the number um, of minutes for kids that are school age because they feel that it's definitely a decision that parents and kids should be making together. Um, so for the younger ages, you know, infants ages um, up to 18 months, screen time is not recommended outside of video chat with um, parent to connect with relatives. So video chatting and um, using FaceTime to visit folks virtually that are far away. Um, 18 months to two years, screen time being limited to educational programming or games utilized with a caregiver. Um, ages two to five, sedentary screen time, so just sitting and watching screens, should be no more than one hour per day and limited to educational programming, um, three hours per day on weekends. And in these recommendations, they're including watching television and that as well. So no more than an hour per day is the recommended amount for two to five. I know with my own kids, I haven't always followed that. Um, so sometimes when we see these recommendations, it can feel like we're being judged or like, um, you know, oh, I don't know how to follow that. And these are recommendations and we're all doing the best that we can. It's just important to kind of go over what it is that they're recommending and then how we can as each household and each parent individually set and determine our own limits and what's best for our kids. Um, school age kids, age six and up families 
should set and determine those screen limits together, encouraging healthy technology use, which is really kind of the key um, to a lot of this management is the discussion of and the utilization of healthy technology habits. Um, so things like screens off at meals, no screens 30 to 60 minutes before bed, uh, no electronics kept in bedrooms, which I know many of us, myself including, are often guilty of charging our phones and, and having them right available next to the nightstand and using it for an alarm clock and all these other things. And it increases the likelihood that we'll use them in our rooms um, or before bed, uh, which we'll get into more um, going on in this presentation, but why that's not necessarily a good thing. So having a stationary outside of the bedroom charging station for technology, including phones, is something that can be really helpful to kind of break that habit of keeping it with us wherever we go. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has their own sample plan that families can use to create a technology plan and anything that's underlined in my presentation is a live link so when you get this email to you you can click here where it says here and it'll take you to the AAP's page where you can use their um, platform if you're interested in creating a plan um, that way. You can, you can use lots of other ways but it's just an example. Um, so also when we're thinking about the types of technology that our kids are exposed to, it's important to note that there are different types of technology. So passive um, technology use would be like watching a movie or a show. Um, and the effects that that can have, research shows us, are mostly negative. And it's not to say that the content that they're watching is negatively impacting kids so much as the sedentary aspect of sitting and watching a show. Um, you know, sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need the downtime. We need to sit and zone out and watch our show and, and regroup or rest. Um, the idea of sitting consistently for many hours a day watching TV is that it lowers our metabolism, it lowers our desire to want to get up and move around, and all of that translates to negative health effects for our mind and body. So when I say, you know, negative educational effects, research is showing us that it has those negative effects mostly based on the sedentary nature of the activity. Um, Interactive technology use, such as playing a video game, has mixed educational effects. So, and we'll talk more about that later in this presentation, but playing the video game, again, is sitting. So any activity where we are engaged in our device or in gaming or on social media, watching TV where we're sitting, can show negative effects because we're sitting and we're not keeping our body in motion or active. And so it lowers our me uh, metabolism, which can lead to all sorts of different issues down the road if we don't learn how to integrate activity in with our time spent on screens or watching TV. Um, there are aspects of video game playing that are really positive. It can be really helpful for kids to learn strategy and um, you know, playing com com uh, together with um, other kids and learning how to strategize. So there's a lot of positive aspects for video game play. And so there's uh, some of the upside to that. Um, social, so using technology for um, socialization such as texting or video chatting, same thing, had some mixed educational effects. It can be extremely positive to connect socially. Um, it can also be a vehicle that's used for, um, you know, bullying or pressure or feeling that they need to connect when maybe um, kids and teens don't want to. Having a device makes them very readily and easily available to everybody. And sometimes that gets taken to the extreme with kids and teens needing to feel or feeling like they need to be available to someone all the time. So it can have both positive and negative effects. Um, educational or online school using or using educational apps has so far um, since about 2016 been researched to show positive educational effects. So that's some good news, right? We can think about that like our kids are in online school or hybrid models. Um, you know, what is all of the screen time doing to them? The research has shown, which is still new, um, but that for the most part, that online learning can have positive educational effects and that there is still the aspect of sitting because it is a sedentary um, act, but that the 
the interaction that we have with online learning is not such that it creates a negative effect with just the aspect of sitting and learning. So there's positive educational effects with online school, as long as we integrate things like movement breaks and make sure that we're taking care of our eyes um, and other management um, procedures like that, which we're going to talk about more as well. So, and certain types of technology um, and screen time is more harmful than others because certain types can increase an individual, a kid, a teen, or an adult, their likelihood to use it or to want to use it based on rewarding stimuli. So, and what I mean by that is based on what you're getting from it, your interaction with it. So video games um, in particular, you know, if there's, um, I'm sure many of you have kids out there that are familiar with uh, like Fortnite or Minecraft or Roblox or these, you know, extremely popular games where there's a point to them. You know, you level up, you get a gem, you find a hidden map. Um, there's a stimuli that's rewarding kids to keep going. We want to keep playing this because I want to get to this level or I want to get to this, you know, reward. So um, it's, it encourages them to keep going because they want to get to that. And it's similar with social media. So social media, you get likes, you get views, you know, there's snaps, there's Insta stories, all these different things where kids can see who's viewed them, who's liked them. Um, and it is really rewarding for them because it um, encourages them to want to continually check or play these games so that they can see, you know, did I get a new like? Did I get a new view, um, you know, look at what, how far I've played into this video game, they get bragging rights, rights with their friends. So certain things, if they give something to us, if they reward us, just like if, you know, um, many of you remember how Candy Crush was so big when it came out, it was really exciting because it was a game you could walk around on your phone and like win. Um, same with words with friends and other things you could play. It was giving you something. It was an interactive experience, but it rewarded us with something. Um, so, and these rewards can increase the desire and make overuse um, become problematic. So when we really, really want to do something, we try to do it more and get exposure to it more. And that's where overuse can become an issue. Um, so, and what's the significance of overuse? You know, um, we need to look at what can it mean when we're on our devices too much and when our kids are on our devices too much. Um, the main things that are interrupted with us are sleep, um, disrupted sleep and impacted sleep from using technology too late in the day. Um, just the screen in and of itself can activate or be really activating for kids especially um, and can interrupt sleep patterns, which then creates grumpy kids during the day um, and makes it difficult to learn and focus online or in person. Um, research also shows an increase in weight gain, again, because of the sedentary aspect of overuse would be a lot of sitting. Um, mood swings, which is often coming from a lack of consistent sleep um, or exercise. Decreased language development. A lot of time um, in research, they're showing that that can be something with overexposure. It would be a lot and lot of time spent on screens and a lot of overexposure. Um, but not interacting verbally with others and just spending excessive time on screens or spending excessive time watching. Um, you know, a lot of kids really, really love YouTube. And so they might watch videos of people playing video games or videos of people interacting in like silly or funny ways. And it's not in typically language that is educational. So um, they may increase their vocabulary in ways that we don't want them to, but decrease language development in um, the educational pathways that we're hoping for. Um, and the similar aspects for reading scores, because technology, unless you're using a reading app specifically or a game that promotes or encourages reading, um, there's not a lot of need to read online. So um, it decreases that as well. Um, decreased empathy has also been recorded. Um, this is something that there's a lot of research tied to with certain types of games and online gaming. Um, not to say that they do that for every child or that that's a definite, but decreased empathy has been um, recorded. Increased inattention. Uh, there's a lot of research about increased inattention or distractibility or difficulty focusing when there is consistent overuse of technology because it becomes kind of ingrained in kids and teens to have instant gratification. Um, you know, videos on YouTube are pretty short. 
um, clips, memes, all of that is very short attention grabbing, um, you know, online use. And so it becomes difficult to sustain attention in the virtual learning world or in person learning because we become accustomed to this, you know, now, 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 quick snippets of information, bright, vibrant lights, you know, moving from one thing to the next. Um, I see that there is a question. I don't know how to get to it. Hold on. Do you guys, Rebecca, want me to do all the questions at the end? Or I see that it says that there's a question, but I don't know how to get to it. Yeah, well, we can wait till the end to answer the questions. Yeah. Just wanted Thank to check. You. All right, we'll keep going. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, OK. So, and then the last one on here, extreme overuse can cause an increase in gray matter of brain and thinning of the brain's cortex, which is responsible for thinking and reasoning. Um, this one I put on here is the very last bullet point because these are things that they're just starting to study. And this is um, in extreme cases where kids, teens, adults are on technology, you know, eight, 12, 14 hours a day. Um, they've built institutions in different areas of the, um, you know, Seattle that has a lot of them and um, some of the other uh, big cities around the world that are just starting to do some research on what happens when there is prolonged um, exposure to the, to the point of skipping meals, skipping sleep patterns um, and really interference with life. So these are extremes that are uh, um, highly unlikely that we'll be seeing in any of the kids or teens that are not engaging in consistent um, and dramatic overuse. But there's something out there that if you're interested in reading more about, um, there's article references at the bottom of each slide if you are so inclined to do some more research. Um, some of the things that we're more likely to see just in this online world now um, are some overexposure can cause some unwanted effects on the eyes. Um, you know, we've heard a lot in the last year about blue light blocking glasses and the blue light that we get from technology. Um, it is a real thing. It can cause eye strain, which can cause headaches. Um, some other things with just consistently looking at a screen that can occur is like we've already discussed just, um, sleep schedule disturbance. Um, when we miss or have interrupted sleep, even for one or two nights, it significantly impairs our ability to think and learn the next day. I know every parent out there is like, yep. Um, like the first year of having a baby, you just, you can't function as well because you're chronically sleep deprived. So when our kids sleep is interrupted, they get into that same place where it's just really difficult to focus. Um, so making it harder to learn the next day over the long term, having sleep interruption and not getting enough sleep can lead to neurotoxin buildup that makes it even harder to get good sleep. So one poor night's sleep leads to more. Um, if it's a pattern created by uh, things like staring at a screen up until the point of going to bed. Um, that can affect our levels of melatonin. So it throws off our entire circadian rhythm and our body clocks, which can increase, um, you know, risks of things like depression, increase the ris risk of obesity. Um, there's a connection between light exposure at night and the disturbed sleep sleep that comes uh, with it and an increased risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer later in life. Um, so this is also just a good heads up for parents too. Again, I'm guilty of this as well. It's just a good reminder that um, having our phones in hand or our devices in hand in the evening is not in our best interest. So it's definitely not in our kids' best interest either. Um, and then all sorts of additional issues can happen with our eyes from eye strain and just staring at the bright light, especially if it's dark in a room and then looking at a small bright light um, can increase eye strain. Um, some classical conditioning ideas and thoughts here, um, certain types of screens like we've talked about already, like social media and video games are specifically designed to draw us in and keep us wanting to engage. Um, and kids are definitely no exception to this. If anything, um, they are prime examples of how video games and social media are designed to make them want to look at them more and more. Um, and I wanted to make sure to incorporate this because sometimes we think like, well, it's, you know, it's got this rating on it, it must be fine, or they're learning good skills. I know I find myself guilty of that, um, thinking like, well, this isn't so bad. 
Um, but it's important to remember that these games and these media platforms are designed specifically to draw kids in. So neurobiologists and neuroscientists are hired in the creation of video games and in the creation of online platform modifications to help elicit these reward systems that trigger um, players, kids, teens, you and I, to want to continue in the games or to continue on these social media platforms. Um, so in other words, some screen time is designed to suck you in. So, and you might think like, well, why would they do this? And why does it work? And the big uh, reason there is that it makes a whole bunch of money. Um, these, you know, online gaming and um, online social media platforms is a billion dollar industry. So um, in 2018, there was $137.9 billion in revenue into these different uh, mobile gaming and social media systems. So you can see just gaming alone, um, mobile gaming, uh, 70.3 billion, tablet games, there's smartphone games, PCs, browsers and PC games, downloaded, playing on a console. Um, it is an incredibly lucrative market and it's only increasing and has only increased now that we are home more and on our devices. So it's important to know and think about that as parents that it's designed to do this. It's designed, these companies are designing, you know, to make money off of our overexposure and our overuse of their product because it is incredibly profitable. So that's a heavy one, it's a heavy slide, I get that. Um, is all technology bad then? And no, the short answer is no, not all technology is bad. Um, having information about technology is good so that we can understand what is designed to help our kids and what is not necessarily. Um, but there are many benefits to kids and screens out there that have been researched um, and having increased access to technology has really opened a ton of doors for kids and families that weren't otherwise opened. Um, so kids and teens feeling or experiencing any feelings of anxiety, isolation, depression, there's tons of online support groups that might be incredibly difficult to get to in person um, or even to form in person. There's also, if we have kids and teens dealing with anxiety, physically going to a support group can be really, really frightening and daunting and actually make feelings of anxiety worse. So it's nice to be able to engage in an online community or an online group um, to begin the process of lessening that anxiety. The same with online mental health services. Um, many small towns, especially that don't have access to mental health services, um, are able to access those via telehealth and online counseling. Um, many online games include strategizing, which can increase teamwork skills and sense of community. There's a lot more research coming out saying even the worst video games, when we think of as parents as being too violent or too um, you know, inappropriate or old, if they are getting exposed to it, there is still research saying that even the strategy in there can increase teamwork skills. Um, and that kind of has to do with the way that it's played, which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides too. Um, Online classes and tutorials are teaching kids and teens a plethora of skills for free that would not otherwise be available. Um, you can learn pretty much anything in the entire world from watching some YouTube videos, which is kind of uh, crazy if you think about it. Um, assistive technology, apps, games, things that can read to kids have all been shown to help increase vocabulary. Um, we know that reading to kids is sometimes really difficult, especially for single parents, households, or parents that are working all the time or when our schedules just don't line up. It can be really great to know that there are assistive technology apps that can be reading age-appropriate books to kids and helping them to increase their exposure to new words and vocabulary. So that's a huge plus. Um, and then, you know, in times of social isolation, social media and gaming can really help to alleviate distress from feeling like everything has changed, feeling separated from friends, um, from routines, from the ability to socialize in other ways, and just feeling boredom. So when used in moderation and when we're aware of what kids are using and how long they're using it, there is a lot of positive, um, you know, things that can go along with technology. So um, when I'm, or in the last slide, when I spoke about gaming specifically, um, some of the increases and the positive things that can come out of that are about the type of gaming. So cooperative versus competitive play. 
if you have a, a child at home that's really into gaming, this will hopefully make sense. I know my fourth grader really, really loves uh, video games like so much. And it's been, it's been a lot of learning, learning curve for myself as well. Um, but cooperative versus competitive play makes a big difference when they're playing these games. Um, so rather than just the type of video game, wondering if this is a good one or is this a bad one, it's looking at what type of methods or what type of settings they can play on. Um, you know, even in games like Minecraft, you can play in a survival mode, which is a competitive, or you can play in cooperative, which is, uh, or creative, which would be a cooperative mode where they can play together and there's no feelings of, um, you know, you versus me or me versus the computer or things like that. Cooperative play is where kids or teens work together. They can create worlds or accomplish a task. Um, these things all show increased pro-social skills and behavior when compared to engaging in the video games um, competitive in the you versus me or you versus the computer format. Um, additionally, games that include violent elements that dehumanize certain populations or that encourage the shooting of human-like targets should be avoided. So um, games out there like Grand Theft Auto and Call of Duty, you really want to look for not only the rating, um, but is this a type of video game that is competitive and it encourages um, violence or anything like that towards what looks to be like real life walking humans. Um, it does make a bit of a difference research shows if it's a type of game where they're battling something that is not um, human. So I know like Star Wars games are big hits out there right now. I can't think of what the one is called right now, but um, if it's more fantasy based, it tends to be a little less um, triggering or ish, um, uh, to show negative effects than when they are um, human figures. Okay, so how do we manage all of this um, during a pandemic, no less? Uh, it's difficult, right? Because we're all maxed out and we're all tired and we are all at capacity like all the time. So having to try to set limits on something else for another human is another thing to do and it's difficult. Um, I totally understand that. Um, some of it is gonna be a change. If you're hearing some of this information and thinking, I need to maybe set some more limits, um, which I still feel all the time with my kids, like we need to revisit this, we need to look at this, we need to come to a different agreement, um, then just taking one step at a time, one small thing, and you know, increasing your knowledge tonight about some of these different things is a huge step. And then starting to think of, you know, when do I have the brain space and the time to look at how we can make more of a family plan around managing some of this? And in doing so, um, you know, here's some helpful hints, hopefully. Uh, so you can make an activity schedule for each day um, or each week. So the schedule can include time spent on schoolwork, time spent, you know, dedicated to homework or studying, social activities like planning things like FaceTiming with a friend or a grandparent, um, going to a park if your parks are open or going on a walk, um, rest, downtime, uh, exercise, free time um, that can include technology, and then free time that doesn't. So, um, and then when there is that time built into your schedule that is free time without technology, making sure that there's reduced access to technology. So putting devices someplace where they're out of sight, um, making sure that they're not charging in their room um, and tempting them if possible, um, creating that like kind of family oriented, here's where we're going to charge all of our devices and it's outside of our bedrooms and we're not gonna be on them for you know, an hour before bedtime setting some consistent ground rules that make sense for you and your family. Um, when you're engaging in your technology free time during the day, make sure that you turn or uh, turn off or mute the notifications so you're not hearing those little things, you know, um, and this goes for adults too, not hearing your emails if you're taking a break to do family time, not feeling that sense of urgency to respond and be available all the time. Um, because an increase with technology becomes um, an increase with sitting, like we've talked about the sedentary aspect of screens, it's super important to make sure that kids are getting plenty of physical movement. So building movement breaks into their daily schedules, um, even if you don't have a lot of space, just encouraging them to do some, some breaks to get up, you know, walk around the room, get up and touch three points on the wall every few minutes, um, you know, get up and do a couple jumping jacks, just building in movement breaks and continual reminding of make sure that you're moving, make sure that you keep your body moving. Um, 
consider adding reading or other non-screen activities as a requirement to complete before kids are allowed some recreational screen time. So um, in that slide at the beginning where the um, AAP talked about their plan for managing screen time, this is one of the things that you could do in coming up with your family plan is, you know, uh, allowing time for social media and other on online games or for gaming um, only after uh, kids have completed a certain amount of reading, um, a certain chore, um, that they have to do certain things in order to get that free time with technology. Um, and kids might not like that at first. I know mine really don't, um, but that has been a, a really helpful one to incorporate into our management plan. Um, some other things, uh, making sure that your child takes visual screen breaks at least every 20 minutes. Um, and that can include going outside, um, looking out a window, if they're in class for 45 minutes or longer, making sure that they are aware of at least every 20 minutes, take a break and just look away from the screen for a couple minutes. You know, you can turn your camera off or let someone know in a, in a chat, like I just need to look away or even inviting that conversation into their virtual classroom of making sure that our eyes are not focused on technology and that we're taking a few breaks at least every 20 minutes. Um, if you have a home setup situation where you can sit next to a window, that's a great thing for kids because it encourages them to frequently check and look outside and give their eyes a break from the screen. Um, you can also use digital wellness apps to provide an overview of the amount of time that you and your kids are spending on different apps or just on screens in general. These can be really helpful just to kind of raise your awareness of how long you're on technology and how many um, minutes are spent on different apps and help to manage it, manage it that way. Um, Establish the technology use contracts where everyone is involved in creating them and feels that they are fair and reasonable. Um, and then trying to join in on the time that your kids are on technology so that you can monitor or turn things like video game time, spin into time together. If you, like me, really don't like video games, that last one hits hard. You're like, oof, no, um, I don't like playing video games uh, at all. I'll, I'll admit it, but I will do it. Um, to try to bond uh, with my kids over that so that I know what they're talking about when they are talking to me incessantly about said video game. Um, it does somewhat help, but it is I'm not going to say it's, it's fun because it's not, but it is something that you can do. Um, other things that you can do to help monitor and uh, manage screen time is ironically use an app for that. So um, I won't read everything on here about different apps, but these are some of the best apps out there for managing screen time. Um, Zift and screen time apps are free for many and low cost for um, everyone. And they have different types of plans. They um, allow you to set parental controls and have certain lock features so that if a kid is on a, a you know, mobile phone or um, a certain app or social media, it'll shut off internet access or um, the, the app itself will shut the device off after a certain amount of time. So that can be something worked into your family's contract is we have X amount of minutes on um, technology today and then this app will shut off the device. So, um, which can be a bit of a rude awakening for kids. So it's good to have those conversations ahead of time and plan and make sure that everybody agrees to that. Um, but Zipped and Screen Time are both really good for that. Um, screen Time also lets you enter in things that they would need to do in order to get access to more technology, and you can reward them with additional minutes of technology if they do additional things like chores um, or extra reading or outside time. Um, so those are two pretty easy to use um, and low cost or free apps that you can use. If you have a usually teenager, but kid, child or teenager that has a bit of an overuse problem and you're concerned about other things like them, you know, texting or um, using other apps like Snapchat inappropriately or just concerns in general about what's going on with screens. These are two apps that you could look into that are more costly. They come with plans, um, but they are kind of the end all be all. You can do everything on these. So Q Studio and Norton Family, these apps allow a lot. So um, you can manage and monitor the content on things like so, um, smartphones 
So tracking text messages, looking at different sites that are being used, location services. These are definitely, um, you know, apps that you want to let your kids know are, are um, you know, a conversation about privacy and trust. And so if that has been lost or broken, these might definitely be apps that are worth having. Or if there's just something that you really feel like is important that all the um, use of technology is transparent and that you want an app to do that for you, these are the places to start. And then last but not least, um, what about safety? So when we think about, you know, kids being online, it's kind of the, one of the number one things is what about safety? Like, how do we know if they're safe? Um, and we can never know for sure, unless you have one of those last two apps, then you probably can know for sure because you're monitoring everything. Um, but other ways are just kind of trying to familiarize yourself with um, the different platforms that are out there and what their safety features are. So WebWise, um, and again, these are links that when you get this presentation, you can click on. Um, WebWise has a lot of really great information about all the different types of platforms for online gaming, um, you know, like Xbox and PlayStation. Um, I can't think of all of them right now, but it has links to how to inform yourself for the privacy settings for all of those different gaming systems um, and understand their ratings and how they interface and like how to protect kids and set safety and parental blocks for if they do want to do um, gameplay with friends outside of the house or create teams. So it's great information. Um, and then for social media use, um, it's really the biggest thing that we can do besides asking kids for passwords and being transparent with their online presence is really educating them about their digital footprint. Um, you know, a lot of kids in my experience in the years do not understand that once you put a picture into an app or onto the internet, that it's not really gone once you delete it, that someone else could have easily copied it, saved it, um, that your digital footprint is um, out there and that, you know, we've heard stories in the news about how, you know, photos can later on really hurt and, and damage people's reputations or their ability to get, um, you know, into certain colleges or jobs. So it's just critically important that we understand online presence and how that can um, have a negative or positive effect. So um, there are a lot of great uh, websites out there that you can help to, again, increase your knowledge of privacy settings and um, parental controls for social media apps. So sites like Caring for Kids um, or Internet Matters both have really great, um, you know, kind of step-by-step -step walkthroughs of how do I talk to my kids about this? Um, and like, what does, the, what does any of this even mean? Um, there's so many new apps out there that even someone that is consistently researching and trying to look into all of this, I can't, I can't keep up. Um, so don't feel bad if you're like, I don't even know half of what she's talking about. There's so much out there with technology and it's expanding so rapidly that it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible to keep up. So part of our role as the parent, as the monitor is to just do our best to try to stay informed about the parental controls, the safety aspects, and then, um, you know, be transparent with our kids about our concerns. So, which brings me to my conclusion. I know we're running tight on time here, but um, so in conclusion, technology is not going anywhere. We're going to have to learn how to live with and, um, you know, utilize it positively. Um, we need to work together with kids, which is it's a crucial step, um, is having conversations about digital citizenship and about our concerns about their online presence, um, about being willing to just talk about technology and, um, you know, the good and the bad. Um, trusting yourself, knowing when to get help if you feel like technology is having a really negative impact on your child. Um, trust that you're doing your best with the situation and the circumstances you've been given. Um, I'm sure that we can not possibly hear that enough right now that we are doing the best that we can. Um, so there it is one more time. Um, and then just talking openly with kids about your concerns. Um, make screen use and conversations about screen use a regular occurrence. Because technology is not going anywhere, our need to discuss it is critically important for our kids to feel comfortable coming to us and talking to us about something that did happen on a social media platform or that does happen on a video game or um, something that they have concerns about. We definitely don't want to prevent that conversation by not being in the know um, even a little bit about what it is that they're talking about. So. 
there are other, past the references here, there are other resources for parents to check out. Um, I put some book recommendations in here. Um, there's a lot of really great books that have been written in the last, um, you know, five to 10 years about technology, how to manage it, how to help kind of pull out of it if you feel like it's gotten out of hand or um, if it's not something that you want used as much in your home. Um, I also gave some web resources of places you can just go and kind of check out um, some things on like kids and texting, parental controls, um, cyberbullying. Um, there's a lot of really great resources out there. And then if you are interested in looking at some movies, um, Edutopia has um, a film festival about technology addiction that they put some short clips up that was really helpful. Screenagers 1 and 2, which came out in 2019, um, are great documentaries. They are often showing um, local or virtually. Right now, I've seen a lot of showings of those. Those are pretty interesting. Um, the Social Dilemma uh, on Netflix, Watch with Caution. Um, and then there was a great HBO mini documentary based on the Seattle-based screen addiction facility called Restart um, that they did a few years ago, which is really fascinating if you're interested in that. And then if you have any questions for me or if I can be of further assistance, this is my email down here and I would be happy to do my best to answer questions beyond um, what we've gone over today and what questions we will answer now. So I'm gonna stop sharing, I think, right? Is that what we would like me to do? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Altiero. That was awesome. A lot of great information. Um, really quick, my name is Brenda Rachels, and I'm one of the Breakthrough Counselors. And we're going to move into the Q&A portion. We got a lot of great questions that have come in. Um, we're going to try to get through as many as possible. So let's get started. Um, first off, you talked a little bit about video games. So as parents, we want to be looking at ratings. We want to look at um, any of the violence that might be flagged. Are there any other um, information or websites for parents that they can access to, to determine like appropriateness of TV programs, shows, or games as well, besides just the rating and the violence that's listed? Yeah, there are some great, there's some great sites out there. One of the ones that I put in that second to last um, slide called WebWise has some great links to um, all different types of rating systems that are out there. Um, most of the time, if it's an educationally based program, TVs and cable companies are putting ratings up in the left-hand corner or right on the description of shows that indicate the age bracket that it's designed for and will even give you a little description of the type of program. Programming. So it would say educational programming or, you know, um, comedy programming. So if it's something that your kids really enjoying watching, it's probably something that's not 100% educational, although you never know. Um, but there's a lot of great um, information on WebWise, and I, I use that one frequently to see, like, what are we watching, and is this educational content, or is this on par with my kids? And my kids have a six-year age gap spread, so it's really hard mm -hmm. to find programming that, that the older one will watch and that the little one is able to watch. So, um, and I use that one pretty frequently to check and see um, what the ratings are. Okay. So as parents, we're, we're getting all this information. Do you have any tips, pointers on how we can have that conversation with our children of what they should be looking at and why they shouldn't just, just trying to help them navigate um, what might be best for them? Yeah, my absolute best advice with this is to start young. And if you haven't yet, then start now. Um, you know, my, my youngest is four and we've been having conversations about technology and screens for as long as I can remember, you know, um, he knows some of that language. We know, okay, screen break, we know TV break, um, you know, because it's been built in and because it's more difficult for my older one who has ADHD to just shut off and say, no, right. I'm done with this. Um, you know, kids with inattention problems, it's, it's, very challenging to set limits sometimes and to say no mm -hmm. to something that they are wired to be attracted to. Um, you know, the internet and gaming and all of that is just prime for an ADHD brain because it meets all of their targets and how they function. So to tell them no to that and to not want to do that is difficult and they don't understand. And a lot of the reason um, that they need the explanation is so that they do understand and that transparency about 
you know, this isn't necessarily good for you. Like it feels good right now, but it's not good. And like, here's why we need to put build movement into our day. And, um, you know, when it comes to safety, it's really important to talk to kids about um, online safety. And yeah. that when you're in an online gaming platform, even if it's Xbox Live and you think you're only playing with your friends, other people can potentially get in these games, you know, um, things like Roblox mm -hmm. and all these games that we think those are just kid games. Um, they're not always safe. And so having those really transparent conversations with kids about there are people out there that are not always good and are not always, you know, um, say who they say they are. And if you see this, if you see this, or if someone's talking to you or asking you to give you personal information, these are red flags and you do need to come and let me know and we'll deal with it. So, um, you know, it's, it's not comfortable to talk to, uh, to kids about these things, but it is yeah. our reality. And the more that you can talk about it and be transparent with them about your concerns and the dangers, the better. So that was one of my questions, but you've, you kind of answered it, um, talking a little bit about how, in, how to keep kids safe from inappropriate content and online predators. So you had stated before, look at your security settings, your privacy settings, and have that conversation that if someone comes up or tries to get involved in your gaming, um, who's someone you don't know to be aware. So a lot of that is just having a conversation and, and doing all the things we can. Is there anything else to add to that? Um, I think just not thinking like, not my kid, you know, I hear that from parents a lot. Yeah. Well, my kid's not looking at that, you know, um, I don't have parental settings on YouTube because they don't need it or, you know, and I'll, I'll hear that and think, mm -hmm. I want to believe that too. Um, but all kids are, are vulnerable to temptation yeah. from time and again. So parental controls are essential. And if you haven't taken the time to get to know them or set them up, it's not too late, you know, look into that and see how to do it. Um, especially with little kids, like there's YouTube kids, um, which is great. And all those videos are already, um, you know, screened to be appropriate for ages five and under, and there's no ads and there's no other things like that. And um, so there's, there's programs out there and there's apps out there that are already designed to meet your kids developmentally where they are and not expose them to extra risk. Um, but the, the idea of it's okay, I know that I've talked to them enough or I know my kid well enough that they're not going to go on these things is probably the biggest problem that I hear and see out there from parents is, you know, we want to trust them so bad, but you also need to be their frontal lobe for them and make decisions and set, set controls because they just can't. I like that. One of the questions that came in that was going off of that was how do you address that with high schoolers? And you're saying, you know, they don't, they're not thinking completely concrete, looking at good decision-making. So being able to make those decisions for them sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And would you say all social media platforms are designed to draw us in? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. the idea. Um, they are. I mean, it works. Look at the <laughs> look at all of our statistics. It works. Um, I know that there's been a, a lot of push in the last few years um, for Instagram to get rid of the little heart, the like feature, because it's becoming such an issue with kids and teens feeling this overwhelming need to get a certain number of likes or feeling really, you know, isolated if they don't. Um, and so what started out as like a picture sharing platform has really become very competitive and, you know, influencers and this whole life that's been built around it. Um, it's extremely, um, you know, easy to get sucked into that. And it is designed to be that way. And that's why there's been such media outcry about let's get rid of this. This is not this is no good for anybody. Um, yeah. But that's where the money comes from. And the revenue um, is the idea that it draws people in. Okay. And then for a child or, you know, any age, elementary, middle or high school, who maybe has a love of information technology, they, they want to um, learn about IT and um, learn about new programs. How do you help them balance their screen time versus also encouraging them to pursue learning about um, computers and, and yeah, IT? Yeah, that's hard, right? Because that's, I mean, these, it's not going away and we're going to need new, um, you know, 
folks to break into the digital world and create the new next big thing. And so that would require sustained and, you know, long amounts of time online. And I think the important part of that is just like with any hobby, um, making sure that it's balanced and that using a lot of screen time isn't necessarily bad. As our research is showing us, you know, educational screen time and learning a skill like learning, you know, computer automated or computer automated design and, um, you know, it sounds like if they're really they're really good at coding or something else. These are skills mm-hmm. that are increasing, um, you know, the brain in positive ways, and it's not something that they're being rewarded for, other than just intrinsically. So it would just mean that same thing: taking breaks because you're staring at a screen, and that can cause eye strain. You know, like making sure you're not sedentary all day long, and that you're getting up and moving around. Um, you know, so it requires a lot of time to become an expert or to be really good at something and, you know, and technology is no different. So just really building in, um, you know, some other factors to be protective factors like exercise and routine and good diet and make sure, making sure that there's no screens two hours before bed and we're getting good sleep and just monitoring it that way. Yeah. Okay. And then any suggestions on, um, helping children, teens find balance um, in regards to social interaction through their screen time. Um, because prior to COVID-19, they were with their friends a lot. And we know that's important that they're connecting with their peers. So how do we find that balance when that is their connection to their friends? Yeah. Um, you know, I get this one from my son a lot too. He's like, well, I just want to chat with my friends. And I'm like, you can talk on the phone. Talking on the phone is totally fine. We used to do it all the time and you didn't have to see someone's face and, um, you know, being on video chat is okay. And it's, it's similar to these other things. It's just everything in moderation. You know, we, of course we want to see our friends. Adults miss that interaction as well. And, you know, adults at least had the the capacity cognitively to process a lot of what's going on and kids didn't, they had everything ripped away from them with very little explanation. um, And it's been a lot to cope with. And so allowing time to connect with friends and video chat and video game or be, you know, online groups and whatever is really important. And it's just something that needs to be discussed and built into the schedule. Um, or built into the allowed amount of time spent on technology. And then other time needs to be spent doing things that can help increase your social skills without being online, you know, reading, um, playing games. uh, There's so many things that we forgot are out there because our first instinct is to turn to technology. Okay. And then can you share a little bit more? I know you kind of went into um, different types of media, how we have passive and more active. So when you look at like video games versus YouTube versus TV watching, is there one that needs to be more limited than others? Or um, like, how would you compare those, I guess, for a parent trying to organize that and, and figure out, okay, so they've had this much time on TV, this type of time on social media. How does that work? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, Anything that is just sitting, sit and get. So YouTube is very rarely interactive. Um, A lot of times they're just watching videos, short, long explanation videos, whatever it might be. Um, So that is, that's less helpful um, on the spectrum of, you know, looking at what could be more beneficial. Um, Social media, again, depends on how they're using it. If they're using it to connect with friends or if they're just scrolling randomly through looking at pictures on Instagram or videos on TikTok, that's, again, that's not benefiting anybody. Um, So you want to limit your time. That's that's a sedentary activity that's not increasing their knowledge really of anything. Although some TikTok videos are crazy educational. You can learn a lot of stuff on there. Um, And then video games, um, I guess, on that spectrum would be kind of more at the top because most often kids are interacting with it. They're at least interacting with the computer server or with another person. Um, Very rarely do you see kids just sit and game. They're usually stand up, get down, move around. It's slightly more physical. Um, So it's and it does have the ability to increase cooperative team building skills. So I would put that one more at the top if I had to. Um, I would say lumping them all together, though, would be pretty important and saying this much screen time. And that includes video games, social media and YouTube, which is hard. 
Um, which is why I think that they don't have a set in stone recommendation for school aged. And it's because every family is different. And some people right now need more screen time to survive and get through what they're going through. And that is okay. Um, as long as everybody agrees to it and has a healthy balance. And as we get out of this pandemic, maybe that will be a time to kind of look at some boundaries once we're out of it, right? Kind of yes. make some adjustments. Okay. And then we had a parent ask, um, for older kids, um, how would you advise parents of older kids about introducing and enforcing screen time limits versus letting them be more independent with their decision as they are, as they are becoming young adults? That's hard. Um, and I think a lot of that is knowing your kid and knowing, um, you know, kind of a little bit from the parental aspect of knowing what's best, but also trusting them to start making some good decisions. And I think some of that comes with really understanding their, their digital footprint, but also do they understand certain aspects of, um, you know, being alone in the world of technology. I know that sometimes kids genuinely don't understand that there are certain, um, you know, ramifications to their behavior with their cell phones. Um, so I think some of that comes with, do you have maybe a contract that you write with your older student, your teen about their cell phone and you allow them some privacy as long as they meet these certain criteria, like, mm -hmm. you know, I will have a time use app installed on my phone that my parent can check and I will only use it this many hours a day um, or, you know, I won't keep it in my room. And so start to make more of like an adult um, type contract with them. Um, and I think that's, that's helpful for adults too, to start, you know, leading by example and doing some of those things as well, not having phone in hand all the time. Um, so try to mirror it more to what you would be comfortable with, with your own comfort levels. Okay. Thank you. And we're down to our last question. We have a lot more we'd like to get to, but just because of time. So we know, and that going into this, we're in this pandemic, we're using uh, social media technology more than ever before. And you've given us a ton of great information. So what could be, if we want to sum up like the takeaway of what parents can remember from tonight of how, what's some great tips of how do they manage the, the screen time and um, what's required for school and what is recreational? Like what's the kind of a good takeaway that they can leave with tonight? I mean, thinking about what they're having to do for online school as what they would be doing in in-person school. So I really wouldn't count online school as time spent in front of technology per se. I would call that school. Um, you know, they're spent in they're spending time in front of a computer. So I would make sure to still instill and have those conversations with kids about taking breaks and avoiding eye strain mm -hmm. and making sure mm -hmm. that you're standing and not being sedentary all day. But that time is really spent with learning and and shouldn't be something that we want to incorporate into these media plans and like, you know, potentially punish kids for. So I would say this is time that you're spending on online school. This is out of your control. Let's make sure that we match that with physical activity. And then let's talk about Great. what we want to do for screens as far as non-school related activity. What is your social media use? What is your gaming use? What is this going to be? Knowing that you're already staring at a screen for this many hours for school, what do we want this to look like? I'm hearing you say we need to try to find some balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. 